We're live and in five. Oh, hello. Don Zanvelt is here. Felix B is here. John Shea is here. Let's see. Are we live? We are live. Hello, everyone. Let's see how we're doing this evening. Oh, hello, Thomas Vanderveld. Um, a bit early, it seems. I moved start time back to 6.30 because of weird lectures. I had a weird day and a weird insert lecture today. And I have some editing stuff I had to get in, and it just made life a lot easier to move it back to 6.30. I do apologize. I, I might... I'm not, I might well start billing start time at 6 to 6.30 so people know it can be sort of somewhere between then because that just might make things a little bit easier. Hello, Felix B. Well, I'm waiting to find out what Dr. Clark makes of my idea. I was more referring to battleships pressed into World War II service, but Riverine War is a bit a part of the uh, two, of course. Basically, I wanted to start off with a little bit of history of paddle steamers, and I wanted to go through all the things they got involved in and what they got called for. So I've gone for a lot. But there are two good books I've recommended in the bottom, which are Paddle Steamers at War in World War I and Paddle Steamers at War in World War II by Russell Palmer, who, which I thoroughly recommend. They're good books for starting off on this subject. And go have a look at them. Alan, John Shea, hello, Brock Payne. Hello, Dunrick Ironhammer. And by the way, the last part of this will focus on World War I and World War II. It has to. But, you know. Unfortunately, none got involved in the Falklands War. <clears throat> Let's see. Hello, Sarah Thompson. I am Sarah Thompson. I am getting worried about you repeating the same joke, but I'm glad you were able to hop in. I wish you could stay, and I hope to chat to you soon. And speaking of that, there might be a little Bill Trump's competition being announced later on this year, so you might want to pay attention. <coughs> <clears throat> some of the Bilge Pumps episodes coming up. And, by the way, my cough has got a lot better. I've been barely coughing at all today. He says that now, and he'll probably end up coughing in a few minutes. Hello, Jess P. Hello, Ian Carr. Can anyone come with paddle steamers in war zones later than the Dunkirk evacuation? Oh, yes. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Carl Gannon. Hello, DM Carpenter. Bo Fi and the flag class Jack Russell. Daisy, our intendants. She is the one snoring. I'm glad she's snoring. Condes uh, the Jazziness. Samat Patang. Hello. Hello, Carl Harmon. Hello, Dan Freeman. Uh, I hope you all noticed that Dr. Freeman, our um, resident medical doctor, has posted some very interesting per paper uh, um, videos on Dunkirk recently. So it's worthwhile going and have a look at them. Dun I think he was asked to do so by Dunrick Ironhammer. Uh, John South. They should have attached scythes to the paddle wheels. Uh, they might have tried. China had them for a while. Al Zaski. Hello. Grace Alty. Hello. Vice Admiral Nelson. Hello. Shane F. Hello. Andrew Bend. Hello. Inquisitor Jackknife. I don't think I've seen you before, so hello. And hello to Al Zaski and Vice Admiral Nelson and Thomas uh, Vanderveld. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hello, Aviator Enterprise and Carl Harmon. Ah, uh, hello, Doctor. This students make you late again. It was a weird lecture today. I had to do. It was the one on why, how you should be doing research and study over the Christmas period, and I got given it because I was apparently the only lecturer who didn't didn't manage to find something to say. I was too busy for it. And admittedly, I get paid for it, so I might as well do it. It's the joy of being a contract lecturer, but there is part of me sitting there going, do I expect these kids to be doing much study or research over the Christmas period? No. Do I expect to be doing much? Eh, I've got one book project in edit, one book project, the, edit, uh, the edited book, which me and my girlfriend are putting together on the Falklands War, um, going through some stages, so I've got that going on, and I've got YouTube stuff. So, yeah, I'll be doing a little bit of work, but will it be in my normal flow? No way. Cargan, no Iron Brew. I've been gone too long. There is Iron Brew. It's just I haven't opened it yet. I'm finishing off my water before I start the Iron Brew. And um, let's see. 
Michael Rose, hello, evening all. Tessa Tracy got me self-isolating on after Christmas, so been looking forward just to help keep me sane. Well, good luck. I'm not sure how this will keep you sane, considering I'm not sure any uh, I'm sane, but, you know, if it helps, good. Ha Jeff Peter, all hail the mighty Guadalupe. <laughs> oh, good lord. Now, I have to admit, one of the things I've found really annoying about this is putting together this thing is some of the really coolest pictures available, the coolest pictures you can find are copyrighted up the nines, and you can't get access to them for love nor money. And when I say that, love nor money, I mean, literally, I was prepared to offer a little bit of money to see if I could use them. Uh, but the price they were asking was for one, if I had it up on the screen for a minute, and they were charging per minute in a vi any video, especially, it, it would be £250 for that minute. Admittedly, that would allow me to uh, for this video to be watched as many times as I like, but on, on my salary, I went 250 quid? No way. Uh, I, if I was a full professor on 120 grand a year, maybe. And before anyone starts thinking academics are going to get paid that much, the difference is between lecturers at my scale, early career researchers, Theoretically on £45 an hour for lecturing, but often paid as advisors on £15 an hour. Uh, always check. They, they put a lot of stuff into your contract. Uh, unless you're actually in front of the class and you're actually doing certain things, it might not be the £45 an hour. So this if there are any young academics working out, this is one of the things to watch for. Check what the administrative versus lecturing percentage of the contract you're, ti you're, ti you're signing is, because if they can put more into £15 an hour rate, they will do. And the difference between professors in my field, the really top professors, who are on 120 to 150 grand a year, and you basically see in the university like once or twice a week if you're lucky, um, is quite a big leap. It's called academic tenure. Once you get it, your pay goes. <whistles> also, your cost of borrowing and loans, because you're so difficult to fire for a university, goes. <whistles> mm. Anyway. Some final. Wow. Well, 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 ground is sunk by a paddle scene. Imagine that one. That would have been quite funny to watch. But did they have the Adriatic in World War One? That kind of Shh. Uh, John South. Last question paddle steamer in the world is Waverley. Is a copy of the battle steamer Waverley sunk during when Dunkirk? Yes, and the Waverley in sunk during Dunkirk had served during World War One as a minesweeper. Believe it or not, and had a top speed of about twenty knots. Ooh. Jeffila, the mighty East Coast anti-aircraft paddle steamers with twin Lewis gunners on top of the paddle boxes. Yo, they had so much fun. Ooh, cool topic. It is. It's going to be paddle steamers. And I'm going to start off with the full engineering history of where paddle steamers come from because it's so much fun. Uh, Ian Carr, Iron Brewer aboard the PS Waverly and the River Clyde. Uh, you can get Iron Brewer aboard Waverly and the Clyde. Hello, Jay Ellingworth. And Steve Mikowski, I'm not sure if I've seen you before, so hello. Don't of I got attacked by blimps during SH3 Operation Drumbeat. At first I thought, what, at the f what is this going to do? Till I realized it was not filled with hydrogen. They had depth charges. Yes. Lady sees England getting King Harold for more than just a few months in 1066. Ah, uh, yes, the whole idea that if uh, that if William had landed first, Harold would have been able to take his massed army to deal with William, and then would only had to march it up north instead of as what he had to do was had itself to deal with William, then march north and then march south. Sorry, I thought it was your Dunkirk one, but I've also seen that one. That's good. Um, mainly it's because his archers get thrown out. It just changes the whole course of the battle because the whole advantage for the English is, in, is infantry and archers. Their cavalry is terrible. Oh, 
well, the Saxons. Let's see. Come, my tooth feels b b much better. Sadly, no iron brew for a few weeks. That is sad. Good, Dawson. You're lucky. A friend of mine has an exam tomorrow. Hmm. Usually, I have to invigilate them, so yeah. <laughs> See, honestly, that's a crazy brush, but not as beautiful as a fairy pintail. Like, <coughs> fairy pintail. I don't know to go both. Kaham, I saw you insulting my dear Pacer train. Doctor, how could you insult? Shame on you all, all you Pacer haters. Don't think I did insult the Pacer. I have traveled them in a few times. Sometimes even willingly. <laughs> the Pacer is an experience. As best left as an experience. Anos, just here for insights into and comparisons with LCS and gunboats in contemporary scenarios, China. Ooh, that will be coming through. <laughs> oh, right then. So. Paddles of War. Well, first I wanted to get into Paddle Seamers because it can seem quite a weird thing when you start talking to people about paddles and they go, oh, what were the first paddles to paddle vessels? Well, they were actually hand-cranked rowing boats. It was a different choice than oars. And it was actually a very sens sensible thing because you think about it, Oars are based on the same principles as you doing front crawl. So they're sort of based on that principle. But instead, it's using different muscles to get more effort in. So that. But you have to do that quite correctly to, for the size of the boat, oars, and what. It requires skill. It requires training. It's kind of like a longboat requires a lot of skill to learn how to use it properly. When you can, you're absolutely deadly. And it looks simple as anything, but it isn't. So people have developed the crossbow, which is a lot easier to use properly. It requires skill, but it's a lot easier training. Well, it's the same with the paddle wheel system. Now, these aren't any of the fancy paddle wheels. These aren't the ones which they slip down or anything to try and maximize pressure in the water so they don't lose thrust and all the options you can get into a paddle steamers. No, these are the original versions, which, as you can see, are rowed by two people. <sighs> Doing that, or... In this one, they are pictured as back-to-back. -back. Now, one of the interesting things that carries on is when you realize that this is done and is put in because it makes life a lot easier for people to do it who aren't skilled. But it's also good for being able to reliably move heavy loads. Now, what does that mean? What I'm talking about is quite often these boats were used as sort of tugboats for other small craft in waterways and inshore because keeping that going and keeping that going when you're not doing your work actually is easier and allows you to get keep the power going more consistently and allows you to get that thrust in. This is where paddles start to come through. They're all about conservation of momentum and conservation of energy of your main power source, which is you.
Dunrick Armhammer, were all your pace, were all your part of a pace of trips at gunpoint? Usually more emotional blackmail than actual bullets. Far more deadly and far more difficult to dodge. John South, any Muppet can use a pedalo. Yes, and I've done it at Center Parks a few times. And I have to admit, it was fun. Although, I also have to admit that, you know, watching some of the other people in the pedalos made me slightly worried when I was in a cock. certain points, my poor girlfriend, who was in the other seat in the kayak, let's put it this way, I've been doing kayaking for a while, I'm quite strong, I've got quite good upper body strength, and um, yeah, I decided it was full military power time to get us out of the way, because the pedalo coming in did not look under control at all. So she was sort of going, is there any point in me actually, I will just do this, and I'm sort of going <laughs> as hard as I can to make sure we get out of the way. But pedalos are a very simple way of this. This is they are a very basic system, but they work very well. If you think about it, it's far easier for someone to use a pedalo than it is for someone to row a boat. Abdowski, and then some crazy German invented a Lego, instant Lego uh, attachment. I didn't think he was German. I thought he was, um, I thought he was Austrian, but no, it's cool. The instant Lego is an interesting system, especially like some of the stuff they've done on, uh, I forget the channel's name, but the guy who's turned it into, he's trying to turn it into a medieval construction. We'll get on to Wolverine. Jeff Hill, the naval battles of Campeche took place on April the 30th, 19, 1843, and May the 16th, 1843. They featured the Mexican steamer, uh, steamer Guadalupe and the equally formidable Motsuzuma, which engaged a squadron of Texas ships. Why doesn't it surprise me that Texas went to war with Mexico? Probably without the U.S. Navy involved at all. Probably the U.S. Navy was sitting somewhere going, Oh, say, can you see what the hell there is going on? Uh, right. Hello, Earthborn Gnome. Uh, and honestly, if you want to go a long straight distance, paddle wheel might be better. The trick with a canoe is to feather the paddle. You have much better control over the boat once you know how to feather. Yes. You know how to have to know how to pedal. Juno one nine is the paddle boat carrier in here? Yes, the paddle boat carrier will be in here. Wolverine, both of them are in here. And <laughs> I'm not sure how paddle wheels work with drifting along the current, but the key to long distance canoeing is let the currents and wind do half the work. I was asking, that's Todd's Worship. Yes, it is. It's Todd's Workshop. Sorry, I forgot. That's the medieval guy, medieval history doing that work. Okay. Jane Peter, can you imagine up armoring and up gunning a pedalo? Steel plates taped on and bread and butter gun lashed to the front? Needed some at Jutland. <coughs> an up armored pedalo would be an interesting construct. Anonymous. Texas became independent from Mexico and was its own country for a bit. Then it became part of the U.S. Yes, and it still does act like an independent country sometimes, Texas. I love that about them. 
John South, paddle seams were amazing as cable is. Yes, because again, they don't have a propeller at the back which the cable can wrap around. Or all sorts of fun things you can do with a propeller. Uh, there are various advantages to a, uh, to a paddle vessel. Jeff Peter, feathering paddle wheels greatly improves the efficiency of paddle warships. Also, made them small targets. Yep. Shigodanak. Shigodanak? Hello! I don't think I've seen you before. Uh, did it. Right, let's see. Now, here are the origins of the steam paddles, and I'm going to have to expand this because it gets massive. Now, the boat at the bottom, on right of the screen, is actually a French little model of what they were. Some of them were built looking like. It's kind of cool to me. You have an ocean-going steam version on the well, the big one on the left of the screen. But you also have. This little rope pad one, which there are various debates as to where it is in the world, but ba uh, basically it was a way of actually going against the current. So you had a rope which uh, spun out behind you as you went downstream. But then when you reached the point at which you had to get back upstream, you engaged the paddles, which used the power of the water, the actual current, to turn them round, winding in on the rope, pulling it back upstream, which is actually a really, really cool technique. And you also have an oxen-powered paddle vessel in China. There were various Roman ones as well, also used in various places. Yep, yeah, that's an oxen-powered paddle vessel. So, honestly... The paddle steamers are really not that new in terms of they are just using a steam engine to power the paddles when paddles have been around for a long time. This is the point I'm trying to make. Because we often see when people start talking about paddle vessels, they start talking about paddle steamers and they consider paddles this discrete period when actually paddles were around a lot longer than propellers as a form of propulsion. Paddles were around for possibly thousands of years as a form of propulsion. Propellers are the new things on the block. I want you to think about that because I want you to think about this as a history of paddle ships at war. There is a reason I've used paddle ships at war. That Chinese vessel, there are various debates of what it is, but it looks fairly warlike to me. Now, maybe that's because I'm an AO historian and I'm reading into it because I'm seeing various lines. But there again, if I'm going to all the expense of making something, it's either going to be moving high-value goods like that in that period, or it's going to be moving something which I need to move regardless of season and I can't afford to wait. That usually means war. Lionheart X-Ray, how does a rear-mounted paddleship turn? I think you're meaning a stern paddle vessel, and basically a stern paddle vessel usually turns the same way as any ship does, it's using rudders. Although, some try various fancier techniques. Constantinus, yeah, because you don't have to deal with Texas shenanigans every now and again. Eh, I've had enough Texas students over the years. Texas shenanigans are usually just code for find the nearest place where we can be loud and have a party. They're usually okay. Ones you have to watch out for are the... Um... Uh, 
Oh, it begins with W. Which state in the United States is that? Let me just check. Yeah, in my experience, the ones you have to be worried about are Wyoming. They're usually the um, silent types who will be looking at things and then will, in a few minutes, figure out a way to blow them sky high. I love Wyoming, though. I've got lots of friends there. They're very cool people. But they are the silent but deadly as a whole. I remember there used to be some jokes going around that gov uh, that Wyoming was a government, you know, conspiracy. Um, because the people who come from that seem to end up so much, uh, so many of them seem to end up in the U.S. Special Forces. But, you know, leave that to one side. And, uh, though for Jutland, it would have been a Lewis or Hotchius Portaviv, um, possibly on the, or Pedalo. Yeah, Texas wouldn't pay its navy, so it's hired itself out to the Yucatan, uh, Yucatan rebels. That nah, doesn't, again, surprise me. Jess P. Hello, Jess P. Paddle boats helped move a lot of cargo into Montana. Shadow River, Shadow Draft, the far, war, uh, the far west had 20-inch draft unloaded, 30-inch draft loaded with 200 tons of cargo. Yowza. Jane Peter. And here I thought Terry Peter and Pratchett made up the Oxen Power Boat. Terry Pratchett was a fine historian, and that's where he got quite a lot of his fun stuff from. Yeah, yeah, to be fair, Bren gun adoption is wild after Jutland. It would be Lewis or Vickers if it's the UK. Hmm. As Jacobs, hello. Speaking of blessings, a very healthy, peaceful, and Merry Christmas to all who celebrate that sort of thing. Jolly, safe, healthy, successive New Year to all. Yeah, thank you. And I agree to it. Pass that on to everyone. Anonymous, China's rivers have long been the vectors of combat and trade, of course. Their ships are dual purpose. Yes, certainly. John Sowers, so who's going to design a combat pedalo for the Royal Marines? Just leave a pedalo at Limston, it'll be turned into something interesting and very short standard. Drop one off. Just just have a tracker on it so you can find out where which war zone it ends up in. Dan Freeman, you might be taking things with the Blessed Blackburn a little bit too far. I am worried for what YouTube is currently thinking the Blackburn. I actually got an email from YouTube the other day, well, me a message on the chat, uh, chat system going, these are a list of words which get sanctioned a lot on your channel. And I'm sort of going, yeah, what ones? Blackburn, Blackburn comes up. Oh, wow. That's basically the primary one. Yeah, you don't need to sanction that one. They're just talking about an aircraft. Hmm. I don't think it was from actually from YouTube. I'm not sure, but yeah. Do the US students often go on exchange to the UK? Yeah, tons of them. Uh, Jane Peter, were the paddle wheel riverboats the King Kang Cowboys gamble on used by either side during the Civil War in what capa in any capacity? Oh, we're going to be getting to those. They got used a lot, a lot, a lot. They were used oh uh, so so much. So 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 much. And um, I have now there is one picture for that one I specifically cannot use but I have put a link to it in the description 
Please, feel free to go find it. Um, let's see, any other questions? Hmm. Wyoming. Alex, uh, Wyoming, Washington? Yeah, I think so. Wyoming is, um, a lovely place. Uh, Piat Potato Peon. As a native Texan, I too regret having to deal with occasional Texas shenanigans. And I'm sure you never instigate them. Hmm. Anos, in the US Civil War, they were in fact Gatling guns, but I know no instance of them being mounted on ships. Um, we'll be getting to the city class. The city class are special. The city class have a similar tendency to certain destroyers in the Royal Navy in World War II in that... It, I'm not sure, sir. I don't know. We just managed to find to have this weapon here. I, I don't know where it came from. And no one really asks why. Abzaski, paddle wheels in its basic form is so easy to build and screw. Doesn't require that much precision making. No. And we'll be getting to that. Uh, Wyoming is uh, aviator enterprise. Wyoming is definitely a problem. When you have more senders than representatives, it causes big problems. Eh. Hmm. Mm. Rob Bain, if you ever find yourself in Kansas City, there's a steamboat Ar Arabia Museum. Boat sank, river changed course, and some folks dug it from a cornfield back in the 80s. Worth a visit. Cool. Don't know. I'll be getting into trouble with YouTube. Not yet, no. Dan Card. DM Carter, that's just wrong. Okay? That's just wrong. Blackburn ba Blackburn is an abomination before the Brewster Buffalo. I'm not sure which is wronger in a more wrong in that sentence, but there is definitely something wrong in that sentence. Not a wolf. Reminds me of the of the chief we have problem. I'm going to take a walk. Yes, sir. Well, it's worthwhile sometimes to take that walk. That walk can be very useful to take. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Now, the world's first screw steamship, screw propeller steamship, was... And I'll expand it out a bit. Hang on, I have it written down. It wasn't Archimedes. Definitely not. Ah, was the SS Archimedes. Um... Pretty much, this is the ship we can sort of put as the thing which causes the Royal Navy and other navies to start actually considering propellers properly. And I do have to put the advantages of propellers versus screws here, because it's worthwhile considering them. Paddle wheels are exposed to enemy fire and combat. They limit your broadside. There are all sorts of issues with them. However... However, 
there is also the fact these are things which count for ships on the open ocean where you need the side wheels. You need to go with the side wheel configuration when you're at sea. Paddle wheels do have advantages over propellers, though. They ha have a higher draft. They are easier to maintain and have the potential to be more maneuverable. As earlier, as they started doing sort of really sort of interesting experiments, the idea that you could actually through having a very complicated gearing system, get it so that you could be driving one in one direction and one in the other direction. It didn't really work that well, some of the testing, but it was theoretically there and could have been developed. The thing was, those advantages and disadvantages have a balancing point, and we'll get into that as we go through. But let's see what the questions are like. Uh, Pierre Potato Peon. I want to know what was just so funny about the black gun, black gun. I googled it. Is it just how the looks? The looks aren't enough. But yes, it is the looks, which have caused it to be fun. But hello, Pierre Potato Peon. Welcome. It was the looks initially, but then we done. Everyone's done a bit of research, and I've talked about it a fair amount, and. There is the fact that it is one of those aircrafts which is just this sort of really ugly thing, and it's really ugly for a good reason. But there is part of me which looks at it and goes, I do not know how you got airborne. Come on, guys. Paddle with a screw. Screw is also more efficient energy wise. Uh, yes, but that. <laughs> how do I put this politely? Um, that comes in more apparently as time goes on, okay? As the systems that support them get in, in more efficient. Just have makes sense to, uh, to name uh, the first ship, uh, screw ship Archimedes. I, I didn't think it was Archimedes for some reason. That's why I was disbelieving the picture. Peter Dawson, if one paddle one paddle is going for one wheel is going forward and the other is going backwards, it should turn on a dime. That was the theory. That's what they were sort of trying to have a look for. And as Felix Peters point out, uh, usually tugs had two steam engines, one for each side, and therefore that one for each wheel, so they could do that. Often again, if we go back to this picture earlier you will notice that there are, again, two steam engines. Well, there are two drive systems. And that was quite common. So that, in the, some of the, in especially some of the larger side wheelers and some of the bigger ones. Jim Heaton, it seems to have gone a bit fast right now. It does. AKM 472. Ah, 72. Read Blackburn 2, two squared. Name is also amusing. Yes, well, basically, the name, the story of the Blackburn, Blackburn's name is that um, they needed a name. They had Blackburn hadn't come up with one. So, literally, all that happened was the Air Ministry wrote in the name of the company twice. Hence, it was a Blackburn, Blackburn. There's also a fairy, fairy going around somewhere, I think. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, but we know it got airborne through divine power. Oh, good lord. My favorite is the Demologues, the first warship propelled by steam engines. Oh, she was built to defend New York during the War of 1812. It was designed by Robert Fulton. Hmm, cool. AKM 72. I guess there is a lot of inertia in a paddle wheel, so stopping it and getting it moving again in the opposite direction might be difficult. It's. A lot of gearing, so how do I put it? Quite a lot of the modern gearboxes in your car, especially the clutch. The principles for that sort of start to be developed with the paddle steamer, 
which is one of those cruel and crazy things when you start going and people go, ah, draw me an engineering thing. And I go, well, you want to talk about the history of the clutch? We have to go to the paddle steamer. And people look at me and go, what the frick are you on about? The clutch must be car driven. I can't know. Think about it. What was the first thing, which is a big wheel, which you had to occasionally change direction and change movement on and reduce power on? So you don't actually get anything called a clutch or anything that is a clutch as we would really understand it. But that's where they first start experimenting with the ideas that would go on to form a clutch and the reasons for it. Dan, a pretty steam engine. Would you have multiple, two oxen? Multiple oxen. Many, many oxen. Right, let's have a look at a, a discussion. This is the Rattler versus the Electro. Now, the Rattler was actually constructed specifically for this test. The Admiralty were still not convinced about the propeller being an effective propulsion system versus the paddle steamer. But, and this was the thing, they did have options. And they, of course, were also the Royal Navy in the 1940s, 1840s. They had plenty of money. And the, and the government, who really didn't know what they were talking about, so they could get away with so much. And so they said they were building a sloop with... A single eight inch pivot gun and eight thirty two pounder broadside. So between eighteen forty three to eighteen forty five, Rattler is actually pitted against a number of pa different paddle wheel uh, paddle wheelers in trials. Um, most soon of these, of course, is against the Electo in a tug of war, but. There were others. And she takes part even in the Squadron of Evolution, where she runs aground. Uh, near Lisbon, but carries off. Does anti-slavery trade and all sorts of things. She's a good little ship. And has a fairly interesting career, including capturing one of the sl last slave brigantines to be caught, the Alapede, which was a Brazilian vessel, in 1849. She also fought a battle at Tao Bay where, alongside HMS Eaglet and USS Purton, which was appropriate enough a paddle steamer. In 1855, and served in the Second Anglo-Burmese War. She actually served with the Royal Navy, well, she's commissioned in 1845, She's broken up in 1856, so she does 11 years service with the Royal Navy and really defines the Navy as it becomes. Electo doesn't have even as long a career as that, really. So, Rattler's an important little ship. And have you all noticed the flags of the Royal Navy at that time? John Self, the idea of two ships having a tug of war. I guess they had just had their rum rush when they came with that one. No, it's actually quite an interesting idea. It was basically both ships were loaded with the same quality coal. They had very similar engines. 
one was driving paddle steamers, one was driving a screw propeller. Let's see which one works. And they're matching, 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 and then slowly Rattler starts to win. Even that doesn't really satisfy the Royal Navy, but it's it's starting for the Royal Navy. It's a start of them looking at it and them going for it. And the fact is they can afford to do that. Remember what Drac is always saying about HMS Warrior and how the Royal Navy tests out all these different things. All these different technologies get tested out in little individual places and watch how other people do them. And then when someone does the great advance, the Royal Navy are quickly able to counter with an even more advanced version. Well, Rattler is part of that process. Rattler is a good example of the Royal Navy doing it. Because if they hadn't had Rattler, Warrior would have probably been a paddle steamer. A good source on early paddle seamers before the ironclad. Warship design development, 1850 to 1860 by D.K. Brown. Yeah, it's good, but I have a loyalty to my father on these subjects, on these things, and him and D.K. Brown weren't always the best at getting on to it with each other. Trent Lanka, the Union's Mississippi River Squadron had a number of ironclad paddle wheel seamers, seamers of the Cairo class in the American Civil War. Uh, Trent, we're going to be getting on to those. As I've said, we're getting onto the city class in a bit. And there's a link down below in the description, which are quite good for them. I always love the way. Uh, I get the same thing in, le in lectures these days. We've got people... There's always people eager to jump to the end of the lecture. Let's get that. Ay, the rumba. But no. Felix B, they stop in meters. Uh, depends on the size. Jeff Beeler, the Rattle and Vector Selecto trials and Wanderers Tug of War, other competitions too. Yes, there was a race, there were um, efficiency trials, there were all sorts of things in terms of them being measured by Stuart for the <coughs> maintenance and other issues they had. Carmen, do any of your students watch your lives? Oh, I hope so, but probably not. John Carson and John Self. Constance, East Indian Company, for when people say modern companies like Amazon or Google have too much power and influence. Yeah. Basically, for the, to imagine the East India Company, imagine... I don't know, Amazon. But they also owned... Trying to think, the world's largest... A Dutch firm, isn't it? The world's largest container ship company. The world's largest airline. And... Who were them, uh, the, the big mercenary company in the US uh, a few years ago? Blackwater? Basically, imagine them owning all of that. And that's the East India Company. Oh, and having the right to raise taxes in one of the most populous areas of the globe. Yeah. Gemma, were there any comparisons to cruise ships versus paddle ships where they sail just on wind without steam changes working? Screw ships seem more efficient for long range choosing. Long -range choosing. Yes, they did try that. Oh. <sighs> 
Back, Brock Payne, you mentioned the paddle wheelers are easy to maintain. Is that because more of the equipment is above water and less constricted area as a hull? Yes. You can clamber all over it quite easily. Think about it. For a propeller, to maintain a propeller, you have to dry dock it. To maintain a paddle, you have to crank it round to the point of the paddle you want to maintain is out the water and then stop the, uh, stop the paddle. You can do that quite easily, comparatively. So, mask American Airline and Academy. Uh, uh, yeah, basically, it's massive. Hudson's Bay Company still exists and is traded publicly. Yes, I know. That's a fun thing. There is a rumor in my family that some of our members, uh, some of us, still own shares in it. I'm not sure. I don't have any myself, but maybe some of the older generation have picked a, have got inherited shares from them. They're a fun company to own shares in. Right. <coughs> Meet the USS Mississippi. Part of the black ship's uh, expedition to Japan between 1853 and 54. And she is, of course, a paddle steamer. Yeah! We're building a ship. We're going to send it around the world. We're America, so we haven't got much in the way of infrastructure around the world to maintain it. What will we send? <gasps> paddle steamers! Also, honestly, this ship was pre the big tests with a rattler and i think the u.s navy was a bit slower than the u.s Royal navy in adoption and movement uh, <coughs> <coughs> and us the bay never had its own army as far as i know uh they had the um mm. they didn't have their own army per se but there were Oh, they had the blue uniforms. Uh, they were German troops. And they were loyal to the king from his Hanoverian uh, things. I'm not sure. I cannot remember, but there were some troops which were closely associated with them. Peter Dawson, repairing rudder is not good, uh, not good either. I suppose not. Mm. I think you can recruit them in total war. Hessians. Yeah, Hessians. And concentrate uh HSA Diana was the first paddle scene to serve in combat in 1824. Uh, I believe you're technically right, although I'm fairly sure some had some more fun before that. The Hessians um at one point, there is a unit out there who are com is commanded by a person who's got a commission as a senior officer out there, but he's also acting as the senior agent in a personal capacity for the Bay Company. So they're sort of, they're not officially combined because it's not the company's actual army, but he's acting as a senior officer for the regiment. And so it's, it's an interesting story. But I'm fairly sure. Uh, I'm fairly sure there was a sort of. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I think it's one of the. It's one of the histories I learned from my granddad. So it's probably come down the family service tree. Could be wrong. But this great, this important squadron, the squadron which opens Japan to the world, are paddle steamers. The other students who look at me and go, "Are you are you sure?" Yes, they are. I'm sure. All right. HMS Warrior is 
well, end of service in 1859. So, five years after this is over. A good ship. And she's the height of technology then. But this is really the height of technology at this point, because while screw ships are coming, screw propeller ships are coming, paddle steamers are far more refined at this point. They're far more reliable at this point in terms of actuality. You can get individual ones, you can get the, the screws better, but these are the ones which are the materials everyone knows about, everyone's worked on, everyone's confident in maintaining and doing long-range work in. Think about that. In less than five years, the world changes dramatically. <coughs> Inca, our paddles are simpler re uh, retrofit to sailing ship. Uh, theoretically, because you got no holes in the bottom of your boat, of your hull. But uh, neither is particularly easy. And you still got a whole lump of steel sitting inside an engine to get out. John South, I would love to watch a meeting between Google, Facebook, Act, and the East Indian Company talk about the role of companies in society. It would be kind of interesting when Google and Facebook realize that they are still just warming up to the potential capabilities that um, they could have. Jeff Hino, Hudson's Bay Company was defended by British troops as needed. Most of the time, they did not need troops, unlike the East England Company. No, most of the time, they didn't really have to deal with the threat, so they couldn't afford not to have the cost. Monday. Does that include Brunel designs? A great Brunel. Would they be more efficient than paddle steamers? That's Brunel. Okay, and the trouble with Isambard Kingdom Brunel is he's a very, very good engineer. He also tends to have the Victorian habit of over-engineering his project something dramatically. So yes and no, but they do tend to be fairly good designs. And also, guys, I have to betray Canada's greatest military secret. I'm sorry, but betrayal is part of my job. General Winter doesn't only serve Russia. So it means Hudson Bay Company didn't need its own army about that, General. Uh, I know. But again, the Hessians did turn to be ones sent out there and work with them when they did need troops sent out to deal with them. Mainly to assist in dealing with rogue French units, I think, which turned up. Uh, but the Hessians... <coughs> Yeah. General Winter does work very well for the Canadians as well. It's, it's the other thing I always find interesting when people go, America would win any war with Canada. Um, when are they actually invading them? What do you mean? When are they actually invading them? Are they invading them in spring, summer, or autumn? Why? Because there ain't no invading them in winter. <laughs> Be a case of your Abraham's tank. Has it frozen recently? Chris Southgate, on the early, uh, early, on early screw ships, could you just uh, raise the propeller on this banjo further up well, well to access it? Where is a cover over the well and that the propeller can be raised into for when under sail? Theoretically, but would you want to do that at sea? It's going to sound strange. Yes, theoretically you can do this. Do you want to actually do it at sea? An answer to most engineers is no. Whereas... Actually, fixing the boards on a paddle steamer happened often at sea. You could do it. It didn't revolve holes in your boat, in your hull. Right, Western was a paddle steamer. Yes. Um, 
Don Juan, I'd love to say, but uh, watching in 144p is hurting my eyes. FB is crawling again. Um, yeah, it should be 854 by 480, 480p. Um, but I have no idea what's going on. Uh, I'm ha I'm gonna do the once I've got the whole office in the garden set up, I will have it run properly, and I'll give it a go. I'll do a tester one with it on full blast and see whether that works. If it does, then I'll continue on with it. Then I come. Carl Gustav Andrut would agree with you, Anos. Win General Winter says more people than just Russia. Yeah, that's right. Lol, my bad. Bring. Hmm. Uh, Freeman, were the Hessians or just generic German soldier uh, German soldiers mostly? Oh no, they were Hessians. Although probably some were recruited from wider Germany. Jeff the Hudson Bay's company built forts like Fort Prince of Wales or Port Ch at Port Churchill, but maintained them with civilians, not troops. So they surrendered faster to the French. Hmm. Felix B, when I visited Warrior, the guide claimed that the screw was not removed because it was di di too difficult. Matt Day, would the US even have the logistics train to invade Canada effectively before 1910s? They had the logistics train to invade Canada after 1910s? What point? Logistics train. Let, let's put it this way. There's one thing operating around the world. There's another thing going and operating in Canada. You're basically dealing with a supersized version of the Falkland Islands, logistically. There aren't really a lot of roads. There aren't really a lot of railways. There is a lot of mountain. A lot, a lot of mountain. And cold. And snow. And. Unlike on Australia, not really a lot of wildlife trying to kill you, but everything else surely is. Mother Nature is really taking the place of wildlife in Canada. Some of the places, if you're not, if you're trying to invade it, if you're just going for a lovely way walk out, it looks great. If you're trying to actually carry out an invasion, no. See, Makassi, so why did screws eventually supersede paddles? Um, well, for the same reason the Royal Navy, when the Royal Navy did this test. And because going back here, screw propulsion does have advantages. You can have more guns. They are less exposed to enemy fire. And... In the end, you can make a screw far more efficient and far more powerful than a paddle steamer. So they go, but that doesn't mean that means they go on the ocean. Doesn't mean they go on the rivers where there is something else to consider, and it's the point down bomb here. Paddle wheels have a higher draft to support a propeller. You'll often have a deeper keel, especially at this time than you will for a paddle vessel. Also, there is the fact that a paddle steamer or a paddle ship vessel tends to have slightly a lower... Uh, uh, does help its, uh, its stability as well. Arnold's, well, Benedict Arnold's invasion was hampered by logistics, but didn't fail because of logistics. Simple fact is the Crown sent reinforcements in spring, and Arnold was massively outnumbered and very unhappy with the rebel leadership. In car, U.S. had some experience with Canadian winter conditions once they acquired Alaska from Russia in the 1860s. Yes, they acquired Alaska. They didn't buy Alaska. And have you seen how many people live there? Um, matter, but the Hessians are more loyal, likely since they got a direct connection to the British English crown, which comes from the House of Hess. And they're not the more reliable of the German mercenaries. Oh, they were very reliable. Hessians were very, very good troops for the British. Excellent truce to British. 
So, Paddles of War. So, I've got USS Sultana here because at one point, oh, she is, of course, the ship which famously at Harbour's Ferry um, is overloaded with about 2,000 soldiers coming home at, at the end of the war and ends up going on fire. Her boilers burst and lots and lots of people die, sadly enough. But she's a good example of the paddle steamers which were used to carry the logistics of the American Civil War. She's a good example of what most of them look like. And the USS Cairo here is a city class. Now, there is a link in the description down below. And, you know, I love the city class. They are some of the coolest ironclad gunboats that you can find. Their propulsion is a two-cylinder, non-condensing, reciprocating main steam engine. The cylinders are mounted at a 15-degree angle. They are made of cast iron with a 22-inch bore and were a of a length to accommodate a 72-inch stroke. Now, this meant they had tremendous torque and power for their size. <coughs> What's fun is they also had an auxiliary engine, a little one cylinder uh, one cylinder unit, which was used to drive two cold water pumps and two main force pumps to supply the boiler with water drawing it from the river. So they didn't actually carry water aboard or fresh water, they used the river water straight up. which did have some fun things. The paddle wheel is actually inside the armor and inside the ship. So it's completely covered and protected. And there are cannon all the way around. And when I say all the way around, I mean all the way around. They would vary between a 8-inch Dahlgren smoothbore, a Army M1... M1 uh, uh, Army Patton 1841-42 pounder, or 84 pounder James rifle. Uh, the um, 32 pounder M189 rifled, or the uh, 30 pound Navy Parrot rifle. Now, these will be spread around and in various positions along the ship, and there'll be lot a lot more put there. In fact, they could be very, very heavily armoured. It was not unknown for these ships to carry a large number of troops and also have a large number of adaptations. Their gun batteries in 1862 were three 8-inch smoothbores, three 42-pounder rifles, six 32-pounder rifles, one 30-pounder rifle and one 12-pounder rifle. Their top speed was four, four knots. They had a tonnage of 512 tons, a length of 175 feet, a beam of 51 feet 2 inches, and a draft of 6 feet, which made them quite deep for some of the rivers they had to go, which was another interesting scenario for them. Basically, these were the powerhouses of the Union Navy on many, many rivers. They would have armour made up of, well, various casements, but also, they would have basically they had iron over wood as their armor, rather like um, Matrix Warrior. Cairo is a cool ship, and I often actually think when we're talking about potential issues that the Royal Navy would have had in a... If the Royal Navy had somehow, for some reason, ended up intervening in the Civil War, we talk about... Monitor versus Warrior. I think more interesting would be Cairo versus Warrior. Trent 
Trent Lankan. That's clear. Distance without defending without defending forces is not an obstacle to U.S. military. Please see Henry Knox and we arrived with artillery captured from Fort Tigronga, forcing Howe to evacuate Boston. Hmm. Calm Gaswood. Read wildlife. In Siberia, mosquitoes actively trying to eat you. Are you in Canada? Uh, they haven't made it across the Bering Strait, I think, so far. <coughs> Arnos. Alaskan Panhandle is warm, in fact. Uh... Warm is such a relative term when you're talking about Alaska, in my experience. Oh, mainly chatting to people, of course. Uh, Concentration. City class under what? City class, of course, US Cairo. For, for city class of... Um, city class, there is a link down below. Uh, I think it's level center in the descriptions. It should show up. If not, refresh and it should show up. Mm. Good evening, shoot me. Grisowski, Illinois. Ah, oh, John Self, drinking river water for when you uh, want your entire crew to get dysentery. Well, not just your entire crew, you're also your ship. No, 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 but I think that Hessians alone, they were not since... In the seventy year war, the Prussians still made up the officer corps near the end, but the soldiers themselves were, well, everything dra draftable. Hmm. I know, I'm honestly unaware of it, any Hessians in the French Indian War or in the Hudson Bay Trading Post. I shall research that, of course. Uh, please do. Um, as I said, it's sort of family history, and it was confirmed by. Sort of by the Total War series, because some of their research did it. And now I always manufacture my Hessians and in the um, Hudson Bay area and move out from there with a full Hessian unit. They're fairly useful. You can get them before you can get red jackets. Illinois place say Cairo. Hmm. She's packing some punch. I'll call her whatever she asks to be called, basically. Do you know what? Was our Kara armored below the waterline around the around the wheel? The wheel is inside her. It's she's a stern wheeler, and the wheel is actually inside the hull. Um, again, all the pictures which have the good graphics showing that I can't really use without breaking copyright. Let me see if I can find one, which is just someone nice who doesn't mind people like me using it for teaching and education stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I was looking all. I, I was looking all last week for this, and I was looking today as well for it as well. Between teaching. Mm-hmm. <coughs> uh, no, that's not one. No. Uh. Mm hmm. Okay, I can possibly use this one. I can possibly use this one from my notes. I'm not sure though. Deadly. Now, I'm not sure how well this is going to show up on the screen. So, if it doesn't show up that well, I do apologize. 
But as you can see, although you can't really read in this resolution, um, the paddle wheel is inside, and it's well inside the ship. Isn't really coming through that well, but you know. In 1816, for war with Northwest Company, the Hudson's Bay Company used its charter rights to raise a force including 150 soldiers from the UK Swiss de Mouron and de Watville regiments. Mm. Nice. Most time in part of uh, going to Russia? Yes. Manitoba and Alberta, such one, are indeed comparable to si Siberia. Yep. Total Tunnel, Total War Series. Yes, the Empire uh, episode. Right then, now. This is one of those pictures which I managed to find, and I'm not sure if I have permission to use, but I know they, they don't actively say you don't have permission to use, so I'm hoping it works. Basically, I wanted to point out that the American Civil War, if you look at it, we always talk about it being a railroad war. It is a river war. And if you look at the March to the Sea and the various things, which are the big campaigns which go on, and you look at all the rivers which are involved, there is a reason for that. The rivers are the essential ways of moving goods around. You know, where the railway, the critical points to hold, the places which you fortify and you protect, and the critical depot areas are the places where rivers meet, which are wide enough, meet railways. And railways go to those points because those are the pre-existing points. The railways were often built to them because they already were significant storage places. Which is why in America, the amount of cities you go through and go, yeah, this is a railway town, and go, there's a huge river running through it. I wonder why. Oh, yes, it used to be a huge river town. And <coughs> these campaigns were all produced thanks to the paddle steamers. <clears throat> Jacob Werner, check Discord quickly. Um... I have the experience that you, whenever Discord is on at the same time as XSplit, one or the other, this one XSplit goes wrong. So Discord is currently turned off on the computer. Hmm. But if everyone else is on, is on Discord and can check, I think Werner's posted some cool pictures. Mm hmm. Jane Peter, you can see it fine. Thank you. That makes sense. No normal field gun is penetrating that depth. Yep. Anos, Union strategy was split the South in three. First split them straight down and end uh, and up the Mississippi. Chandler, are we going to see anything about Admiral Porter's Red River campaign? His escape via surfing paddle wheelers between two U.S. Army dams is wonderful. I would, it's going to sound strange, some of the things I have decided to save for a future special on them, and that was one of the ones I want to do a sort of special on when I can find decent pictures and go into enough detail. I'm going to do more about the Nile campaign and the First World War and the Second World War minesweeping experience today, probably. Evening, Andrew Cox. Ah, Jeff, well, ah, just telling you what I know regarding copyright. Oh, don't worry. I will definitely be reading that. I do have a lot of fun with copyright. I do specialize. I, I am sort of slowly developing a specialist knowledge in it vis-a-vis uh, -vis this YouTubing. 
It's something which you have to study quite a bit. Yes, well, the, the the battle plan was sensible. It's just the execution of the battle plan, which was terrible for the British in the Civil War. I'll be back in a second. Uh, well, in the War of the Independence. <sighs> Mainly because we put idiots in charge. Massive idiots in charge. Bah, gum. Yeah, right. So, and as I forgot to say earlier, hello to all the people who are watching us live for the first time. Well, me live for the first time. I'm not sure why I said us. Probably because I've spoken, I've spoken to so many of you right now, I consider you sort of like a class and we're all in it together. <clears throat> right, let's see. Brockpain, US railways were also often built to follow the rivers because they were easy to survey and had nice gradients, plus ready access to water. Water. Very early steam engines need a lot of the stuff. <clears throat> there is a reason why American steam engines look they, like they do, whereas British steam engines look like they do in a similar periods. And the reason is literally due to the ready access to usable water for steam trains, i.e. Britain has a far denser level of supply. There again, Britain is a far smaller place. Here, part of Winifred Scott's Anaconda plan was to control the rivers. No ship-to-ship -ship battles on rivers except in Memphis and Vicksburg. Ships versus forts. Eh... Interesting enough, most of the studies I read and have discussed, and I have to say, Bruce Canton's series is particularly good on this one. The ship to ship battles. They don't tend to get recorded that much, and it's rare they seem to involve something of the size of the city class. If they involve something the size of the city class, it's a really big battle. But normally, it's a hastily converted ship, paddle steamer, just letting off a couple of rounds at another paddle steamer, and then both scooting off. Because Neva's armored, and Neva really wants to slog it out, because there isn't space to maneuver in the river. I, know, I imagine the South's naval builds were all about blockade runners, but don't know if for certain. Though they do seem to build many ironclad panels. 
uh, they do like them as well. Both sides like them. Piet, but, uh, potato peon, it's fun watching live. I'm glad it is. <laughs> you can sense the holy presence. Of the oh, good. Okay, this is the alpha problem with a Blackburn Blackburn. It has become a bit of a religion on this channel. Which freaks me out no end. In that I'm fairly sure, as someone pointed out the other day, and since then it's been stuck in my mind, I am going to at some point, someday, have someone knocking on my door from, I don't know, the National Statistics Agency, or whoever compiles the census in the UK, whatever their name, their organization is going to be, by that point, going, to what, what do you know about the Church of the Holy Blackburn Blackburn? And I'll be going, okay, come in, fine sir, ma'am, whoever you are, sit down and have a glass of iron brew. This is going to be a long one. I imagine the uh, Anos, I imagine the South Snail Bills are all about blockade runners, but don't know. So they seem to build. Uh, they do seem to build many ironclad paddle wins, or is that just propaganda? To an extent, but a lot of the how I put it, not just propaganda, but also sometimes a lot of the popular history focuses on the very cool topics, and the blockade runners are cool. They're cool. They are the. How do I put this? In World War Two, World War One actually, let's go for World War One because that's the option. It's a better option, right? When we talk about talking about fighters, everyone talks about the stop with camel. Actually, pound for pound, the SE Five was better, but we talk about the stop with camel. When you talk about World War Two, you talk about the Spitfire, not the Hurricane. When we talk about peacetime interwar presence missions, we talk about the Sand Class cruisers, not the various classes of sloops. When we talk about the Battle of Trafalgar, everyone focuses on the role of the large ships of the line. No one talks about what the frigates were doing around the edges. History has a habit of focusing on the really cool and the really big pictures because they're easy to pass on and they stick in people's minds. But paddle steamers were just as important for the South as they were for the North because for the same reasons, logistics, logistics, logistics. <clears throat> Anos, excuse my ignorance. Must steam engines use fresh water, or can they also use salt water? Fresh water. Salt water is a good way of destroying a steam engine. It will calcify it and lock it up in seconds, and plus there's corrosion, all sorts of things. You have to use fresh water. In fact, that's the big problem for steam engines: is their fresh water supplies. Um. It basically it's something you use only in the direst of circumstances when you know wherever you're going you're either not gonna have to use your spoiler again or you can get the entire ship refitted. Contamination of feed water is one of the biggest problems for engines. And one of the easiest ways to sabotage your vessel. Okay, Adrian, just support the cult of the Catalina instead. I am worried that I've now started the second one, so I'll be getting two visits. In car, can I say Blackburn, Blackburn, plurry food like a rock? It could be worse. 
Trent Lunker, USO War the Riverine campaign had a number of steam rams with a few guns and a ram to deal with uh, deal with ironclads. That was certainly the idea of the ram. Cotteris, you are not going to cover for us on the beat at Blackburn, Blackburn? I probably will, though. I'll probably be a nice person and cover for you, but you know, there's something worrying about it. Jeff the first battle of Memphis was a naval battle fought on the Mississippi River immediately above the city of Memphis, Tennessee. June 6, 1862, the Confederate Navy was what River Navy was wiped out. That particular squadron was wiped out. Well, uh, Brock Bain. Bla uh, blockade runners are the hand solo of the American Civil War. Pretty much. I was asking, could I become the High Bishop of the Holy Bit of Blackburn Blackburn Church in Poland? Oh my god. Talk to Dan Freeman. He's the organizing bishop in the UK. I nominate the. I'm not sure what my rank is, but whatever it is, I'm using it to nominate Dan. Dan can make those decisions. Church of the Blackburn Blackburn. Now that's the latter day biplane. <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> oh, this is how civil wars begin. You have multiple religions about the same aircraft. Very saucy. Rep Butler was also a blockade runner. Mm -hmm. The dashing hero mythos. Yeah. Um. John South, my favorite warship name is still HMS Cockchipper. Whoever was in charge of warship names back then had a great job. There were a fair number, and they were the, sh the ship naming committee. The people, the group is still in charge today, although they're different people, I hope. Unless they're all vampires. Which wouldn't surprise me, but uh, I'm sure they're not. Andrew Cox, plus historians want to work on the really cool stuff. That's true. We do like to work on the really cool stuff. It's why me and Drake drink Iron Brew. What else would really cool people drink? No, I'm actually having an interesting discussion the other day with Drac, I think with Drac, about the fact that there is all this real ale stuff that goes on around one. These find these pubs that sell real ale and all these things. We we're wondering if someone would ever start a real cola or real soft drink, you know, company that would do that do that sort of similar same thing. And we thought it could be an interesting idea, but you know, we couldn't imagine doing it ourselves. But someone might, doesn't they? Tom Vano, I always wonder how far how Lee could push that far north every single time without getting a reputation like Sean. <clears throat> now I have the answer. Mm -hmm. Andrew Cox, contamination of feed water is even worse if you go nuclear as the salt becomes irradiated. Oh, contamination of feed water on a submarine is just not a nuclear submarine. is just not a scenario you want to be in. Nowhere near anything, any liquid going near. The fact that the best thing that was happened was when they stopped using water in pressurized water reactors in submarines. You are the prophet. Oh, sugar. <laughs> Grace House, gone with the wind. Ah. <coughs> this <is> all... <laughs> mm hmm. No, I mean, perhaps a role like God, like Emperor of the June, or Emperor, just a, or just a living saint. Uh, the, 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 the. Well, the Emperor in forty K does get plenty of sleep. Um. Hmm. From Chicago, real co curler is a big deal. Thing I say, we paid about double or triple for it. <coughs> uh, 
That could be the other problem. Jeremy, I start to agree with Doctor. We've probably have gone too far, but back to the paddle scene. Any interesting stories from campaigns in Scramble for Africa era? Well, hence the colonials coming up. Nile Expedition, 84 to 5. This is, of course, the first one to try and relieve General Gordon. And it involves some Canadians being hired. Lots of Canadians being hired to help with the river work. It has a whole load of sailboats, which about 3,000 troops are going up on. Another 2,000 are marching across land at one point. And it has some paddle steamers. Now, they're pretty darn cool. They have a single gun on. Some of them have actually more than a single gun. They are manned by the Royal Navy, and they get thoroughly adapted. In fact, at one point, the general in charge of the relief is not quite sure, but he's fairly certain he's lost some of his artillery. Interesting enough, it's the shipborne uh, steamers, which the steamers which actually get closest to Khartoum, but they arrive. I think it's a day after it's fallen, and the commanding officer, instead of carrying on, basically says. <gasps> I haven't got enough troops, I'm going to draw it. And the what's interesting is the naval officer sitting there going, We have X number of artillery guns here. We have all this firepower, and you are withdrawing. Yes, I haven't got enough troops. Why do we need to withdraw? We've got... We can blast them from the middle of the river. They won't be there. No, I am the general in charge. Yeah. No idea. The Encarna, decades ago, Coca Cola and called itself the real thing. Mm. Chris Southgate, uh, American Civil War River Actions. Plum Point con um, Confederate ships raid U.S. City class force at night when they were anchored. U.S. Army ram fleet, passage of the CSA. Uh, of the Confederate state ship Albemarle. A partially completed ironclad through the Union River fleet. Ooh, fun times. Andrew Cox, I live in Germany. There are already over 150 different colors, but somewhere around 10,000 beers. I think that could be an underestimate of the beers in Germany. I honestly do. Almost every German I know seems to be brewing their own beer. Seriously, I, 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 I it's the it's, it, There are two things which I know a lot of Germans who do, and model railways, especially O gauge, O gauge model railways. I, I always thought N gauge would be very popular in Germany. It appears to be O gauges, which I can understand. It would be cool. I'd love to have an O gauge railway running around my garden, but we'll leave that to one side. That's something for a future project. Um, N gauge railways in the bookshelves. O gauge railway in the garage. O gauge railway around the garden. I'm an easy person to live with, really. Um, it's fine. The, the, uh, this is one of those things which would be quite interesting. The sheer amount of, you know, Germans I know who have railways and brew their own beer. And Canadians. Canadians also brew a lot. Dan Riemann, two things that are amazingly corrosive, salt water and oxygen. Really, really bad. And if you think about how many things depend upon oxygen and water... Which, of course, is also made of oxygen to survive. Yowza. So, I'm are you talking about OBK555 powered Project Legion? You know, that one crazy naval reactor and one crazy sub. Mmm. To be honest, 
that wasn't one at the front of my mind, but is one that fits with the criteria I was talking about. PWRs are um, interesting as a whole. Howard Maxi, hello, Howard Maxi for starters. To see, I don't think I've seen him before this evening. And an old can be chanting Blackburn. Blackburn would be quite something. That'd be quite scary. And Maxi, wasn't that the delay because Brigadier Wilson replaced a mortally wounded Major General Stewart and was way slower in organizing the amounts and all? Oh, yes. Yes, way, way slower. And let's be honest, Wilson is. Wilson is a very methodical, very thorough officer who you can guarantee will do nothing wrong fast. He'll also do nothing right fast. He will make sure all his I's are dotted, all his T's are crossed. Everything has a full stop and everything is neat and tidy. That is his criteria. That is what he will focus on the whole time. Mm. Andrew Cox, almost every town has its own brewery. Mm. You're a Southgate. Also, last Confederate unit to turn itself in at Liverpool was CSS Shenandoah. Screwed her. Yes, she was going to be one of their um, planned uh, vessels for... Uh, Doing all sorts of things. She was supposed to be doing a surface raider. Then I can't hurt. Andrew Cook, stop trying to tempt me to move to Germany. Mm. Felix B. Mineral space model railways are very British things. I, I, I've seen quite a few American videos with Engage. Tarzana. Ah, well, now I've got an exhibition. My God. They do well to put Kitchener in there. One of the few journalists of his time to see, ti to see times had changed and to look uh, on, the, on the Sudan affair the way with, they had to do it. Ah, that's the next one. There are two Nile expeditions. There is the 1844-5 one, which was the attempt to relieve Gordon. And then there is the 1896 one where um, Kitchener is sent down and told to make sure they never rebel again. Make an example of it. And we'll be getting into what he takes with him. Stuff on, I lost my railways. Oh, stuff. I am. Oh, that just terrible. I'm so sorry to hear, hear that. Dan Freeman, would your model railway be going around the 1, 1 to 1 inch scale model of a tribal destroyer? Um, I don't think I'd have a model railway on her. Oh, I'd be far too many other things for me to deal with. In car, there have been four cockchafers through history so far. I have suggested it for the name for the Type 31s, or at least for the Type, um, the River river Class Batch for Fall or Freeze whenever they turn up, which I'm fairly sure will happen. Oh, okay. Is there a way to make paddle wheels great again? Or propellers and especially hydro jet on rivers killed it as vile technology? No, paddles are still fairly good. They just, honestly, they're not, uh, the modern technology, uh, the other stuff has been refined to such a point that it's now going back in efficiency to go to a paddle steamer. Whereas when they were being built, they were the more efficient tool because they've been refined equivalently better. But okay, no, no, no. Andrew Cox, I'm afraid the tribals and towns will be too tempted to find on the train. Only if it was a German engine, or a North Korean engine, or a French engine, or an Italian engine. I think they fired on some Norwegian trains at one point. Yeah, basically the only trains which would be safe would be British ones. I'm not even sure if some American ones weren't fired on at some point. 
and the model of HMS Unicorn would certainly be firing wings. So, this is one of my favourite pictures of it, but it is, and I have to admit, it is kind of faded, is USS Ashlot of the Yangtze Patrol, which were a whole load of American gunboats in China, and they're going up and down rivers and large canals in China. Paddle steamers, anyone? Felix B, there were not enough General Gordons, apparently. Um, not sure I rate General Gordon that particularly highly. I presume, by the standards of time, he was quite good, I suppose, but I'm not sure I would... Um, let's put it this way. Uh, his technical orders were to um, withdraw, and he decides to hold out in Khartoum without enough troops and without the riverside properly secured, without the river, depending on the river, to do the security for him of the Khartoum. So, uh, basically, he has enough time he could have done something about that, so that he didn't have such an obvious weakness. She's rather cute, but you can see she's a river gunboat. She has a few gun ports, she has a space for a few troops, She's not something which is really screams at you warship, though. Pete Johnson, look at the USS Barb in order to. I will do in a bit. Jeff another favourite, USS Monocracy, a USS side-wheeled gunboat, built in 1866, then sent into the Asiatic Squadron until 1903, serviced so long that she was given the nickname Jinrixa. Very hard to steer. That wouldn't surprise me. No, oh, actually, well, Gordon in China is a different story. Hmm, Yes. Gordon in China is a fairly different story than Gordon in Africa. Oh, um, Tom but which other sea based nuclear reactors transferred to non H2O coolant? You got me very curious now. Hmm. It's also what they use for the coolant instead of water and some of them. Yeah. Uh, some of the liquids, frankly, you just don't want that gunning out. <clears throat> Always be slightly worried about nuclear reactors. They're useful, we understand them a lot, but... They are still a highly controlled explosion. Jeff Hiller, Chinese Gordon in Saddam was out of his elements. His relief in the expedition including can included Canada's first overseas military commitment. Yep, uh, they were the special people who called in to help with the rivers and were actually getting over the rivers. Andrew Cox, Alphas had liquid sodium. Yes, in their reactors. It's hot enough, it's keeping salt liquid, basically. You might know. What I love particularly about this little ship It's the fact she just does this cruising up and down the rivers. They all do, and they get minimal service, minimal maintenance, and that's the reason they go for paddle steamers, because the crew can do vast majority of maintenance themselves. 
because they realize they're in a place where they cannot trust most of the local maintenance positions to support them. Because, A, they're going to try and charge them a bomb. B, they're not sure if they can rely on them. And C, they're not sure if the locals actually know what they're doing. That's him. Uh, Canadians are clearly the people you want for a dick to see hot place. Not Australians at all. Uh, actually, they did want Canadians um, because they were doing the river transits. And the Canadians have these teams who are the Canadian voyagers who are, incre are incredibly experienced at transiting rivers and getting people up and down rivers. And if you can't trust the local, uh, and it was worried you couldn't trust the local Egyptians, well, then you then have to bring in people who are used to moving things up rivers and down rivers. Britain have its own populations of those in that in that time they had canal people but they didn't have river people and the canadian ones were the best however not sure why that disappeared up the corner there This is what comes next. This is what Kitchener brings with him. Yes, it has a stern, central paddle. It's in the aft housing down sort of there. I'm just up there. See, about the end. Uh, it has a variations on guns mounted in the front, but it also has another one mounted on the stern, just for the hell of it. So it's got two guns that go pop, pop, pop. It's um, nice and high, lots of space for men and equipment on board, lots of space for machine guns, and pretty much this is the firebase. So what Kitchener does the whole way. Is his entire desire is to bring out the Maddie's army and have a fight. That's what he's he, he he's going to Egypt spoiling for a fight. That is literally what he's looking for. He doesn't care about getting the Khartoum. He doesn't care about anything like that. What he cares about is fighting the army and beating it. He doesn't want them running off, so he has to give them something which is tasty. So instead of moving along. Uh, on the on the river, as you think he would, he has his logistics coming up the river. He has these gunboats with him on the river, securing the river flank. But he actually keeps his troops moving along the shore. This means they move slower as a force than they might have otherwise done. But it also means they become a more attractive target, and eventually, the Maddie takes it. Now, Hmm. 
Don't know had a triple steam circuit, which is kind of logic, transferring heat from molten lead to water. For every cubic meter of 400 degree heat, hot lead, you're heating, what, 10 cubic meters of H2O? Possibly. Hello, Sunroll. Good evening. Kazarian Kana, what is that thing? That's a paddle steamer gunboat from the 1896 Narlex edition. <laughs> that is a strange looking ship boat thing. You uh, may <laughs> Well, here's the thing. So, I'm not sure which one of them it is. I do know their names. Um, even the Maddie Navy has, uh, Maddis has some ships, but the. Um, the Egyptian ones, they're called Tamai, El Tab, Mehmet, Abu Klea, and Calabar, Dal, and Akaska. I think this is the Tamai, but I'm not not a hundred percent sure. It could also be um, the um, the Melik, which is um, which is aimed to. Actually, I think it is the Melik, and I think it's been, it's the one being preserved by the Melik Society, but I'm not sure. And it's a very cool little thing in history. It is the real ship, Andrew Cox. It is the real ship. Oh, no, Maxim's 20 millimeter. Hmm. The sun sail is a nice thing on the gate. Well, it's, it's something nice to have. Jeffy, look, by the 1880s, Canada had a few rivermen, so most of the volunteers were from the militia and led by Colonel Fred Dennison, a lawyer cavalryman. Mm. Guido R. Ah, hello, Guido. Ah. Just received a model of the motorized submersible canoe to see Sleeping Beauty. The specials model, granted that, uh, granted, that does have auxiliary screw power and is hardly classified as ship. Mm. Know, the Maddie was actually dead by the time the original one was. And somebody else is taking over command, or do I get this wrong? I think you might be right, but I'm not sure. That room. The idea of advancing on land and having a logistics base on water sounds very like the way the Romans did their exploration of around Scotland. It's a traditional methodology. It keeps your logistics safe. Yeah, if you can't find proper words for this gunboat, just remember the word blocky. Jeff Elam, Kent Tolley, an officer who served as executive officer on gunboat U.S. Tutelia in the 1950s, wrote Yangtze Patrol, a well-received history of the patrol. Yep, it is a good book. Carhaman, mm, the duck. <laughs> Perhaps it's the water-based part of the Holy Trinity. The Blackburn Blackburn will be the airborne, and now we have the divine, we wait the divine land ship. Oh my god, if that's true. <laughs> is that a dragon painted on the bow? I I, I, I think it is. Some, well, let's expand it and see. Uh, it is something on the bow, but I'm not quite sure what. Could be a dragon. It could just be some embellishments, some waves.
No, she's a cool ship. If you do have to wonder who actually designed her. There again, I don't think they were designed to go that far, so streamlining probably doesn't matter. Although, it does strangely look like a pillbox in some perspectives. Jenna, time to take my leave with Jeff I shall review a further discussion tomorrow. Take care. Hmm. Ooh. You could build that with Lego, I think. During the 80s, 60s, and 80s, 70s, the American merchant ship on the Yangtze River operated up to Hackner, uh, Hank, oh, uh, 680 miles inland. In 1874, the U.S. gunboat, U.S. Ashlot, reaches as far as Inchung, Inchang, 975 miles from the sea. Yep, that's one of the reasons why I had the Ashlot as the example. There you go. There's the Ashlot. Damn I think muting things have happened. Hmm? Inca, hard to imagine the medic crossing the Bay of Biscay on its way to Egypt. Yes, it is. Anos, if the ship is canoe ship, it's very good at using human legs to jump rapid. Yes, yes. Uh, that's usually how they get there. Alaski, so we now need a crazy tank abomination to make our Trinity whole. Oh, goodness me. All right, let's start off with the 20th century. Here you go. Here's HMS Plumpton. And she is a paddle-sweeping minesweeper. The race course class sloop. Yeah. And before any of you start thinking, well, the Royal Navy had made a decision years ago, so, you know... They don't need to, they, they wouldn't still be investing in paddle steamers at this point, would they? Well, let me correct you. The racecourse class minesweepers are 32 ships ordered in the First World War. They're built between 1916 and 1918. There are 24 racecourse class and 8 improved racecourse class. They're also sometimes called the Ascot class, because HMS Ascot was the first of them. And they're pretty cool little ships. They're not unusual for this time for you to build minesweepers as paddle boats. And there's a very good reason for that. Remember we talked earlier. Paddle boats tend to go shallower in the water. So for... Mm, coastal <coughs> and shallower waters, they actually make sense. Also, there's the maneuverability aspect. You can have one engine go one direction, one engine turning the other direction, and get your things going round to give you a slightly better maneuverability. So, you know... You can also do that propellers, but with them being both on the stern, they tend to have a wagging effect on a ship rather than a spinning effect. So, these are some very cool little ships. And very good minesweepers. In fact, they are so good that actually the Royal Navy does consider using paddle boats, well, 
actual building a paddle class in World War II for this role. They actually they make different converter ships, but uh, it's, it's tempting. Uh, Thomas Hunter, okay, this is taking on life of its own. I mean, we've almost got a trinity, and next come the crazy robes. Don't worry, I'm sure Dan can hook you up with some PPE. <sighs> named after C, named after race course, I think. Pompton race course. Learn hard x-ray. That shit confuses my brain. I like them. I think they're rather cute. It looks like quite a sleek hull design. And you sit there and go, well, you know, how sleek can they be? Well, they had a displacement of roughly 823 tons. The improved class were 833 tons. Their length was um, 72 meters or 235 feet. Their beam for their race course class, the original ones, was 8.8 .8 meters or 29 feet. The improved class, 8.92 meters, so they've grown up by 12 centimeters. So that's 29.3 feet, uh, 29 feet, 3 inches. But with paddles, both types would extend out to 58 feet or 18 meters. Now, let's put that this way. So, the paddles are roughly five meters across on both ships. The paddles and the paddle bit extensions around them add five meters onto each side. This is why I sometimes compare them to sort of uh, ships. They're kind of like um, a try a, a, a mono hull with outriggers. The way some uh, the effect you sometimes have from these paddles, because they are quite such large constructions. Their draft was less. It was seven feet or below. <coughs> I was up to seven feet or two point one three meters, which was uh, it, it, it's quite good for their size and time. Their top speed was officially 15 knots, and officially they could carry a crew of 156 tons of coal, but both things could be adapted in time. Their complement was 50 to 52 personnel, and they would carry two 12-pounder guns. The improved class, built in 1918, carried a single 12-pounder gun and one 3-inch anti-aircraft gun. And they were designed by Elisa Shipbuilding Company, which is quite a famous little company in Scotland. Uh, they were founded in 1885 and only actually went defunct in 2000. They were based at Troon, which is also remembered as a Royal Marine training base. They built a, cargo, a couple of cargo ships, an Italian Navy gunboat known as Tobruk. Various uh, various ferries and things over time. Basically, they were small ship specialists. Up to and including 1904, the 1904 HMS Warrior, a steam yacht. Basically, they turn into almost mine super specialists for the Royal Navy. They're a good little company. And it's a good ship. I rather like it. Okay, this is one weird one weird boat. 
I'm even doubting about where the bow stern is. <laughs> Hello, Richard. Hmm. Say, if you're looking for the Blackburn Blackman of tanks, I'd be tempted by the Sheridan, but, you know, that's just me. Abdelski, looks more like it was chopped in half and the paddle wheel section from another ship was put in the middle. Or it's three ships combined together. Two single funnel ships. Chopped in half, just after or just before the funnel, and then the paddle wheel st bit stuck in the middle. <sighs> Andrew Cox, I shall put it on his next Q&A. If the chieftain is confused by it, that will be something interesting, and just say hi to the chieftain from me. I haven't ever met him, but it'd be fun to chat. <sighs> Jeff Beeler, Dirt Squad, was introducing the Blackburn Blackman to Chieftain's World of Tanks YouTube stream last night. Oh my. Many combat ships in World War II use paddles. How many? Um, a few were available in World War II still using paddles. Uh, a fair number in World War One. a lot more in World War One. Um, Jeff Peter, did a race course class have anti-aircraft guns like Lewis guns on paddle boxes? The improved race courses carried a 3-inch AA gun on the um, stern, and I do think they ended up getting festooned with machine guns as well. Andrew Cox, Sheridan, your suggestion to be considered and determined to be unworthy. It's too cute. But, think about this. The Sheridan is built for a specific role, like the Blackburn Blackburn, and the Melee, and it is very good in that specific role, but ultimately that role is superseded by events or time, and means that it actually serves, uh, turns out to not actually be, by, uh, not actually be a viable system to be procured for the, wi for the wider forces. So, although now we are, of course, seeking to reinvent the Sheridan. Jeff Peter, what duties did the race course have other than minesweeping? Uh, they did a nice line in escorting convoys, coastal convoys, and a very cute line in anti submarine warfare operations occasionally. Eric Kaufman, have we talked about the Great Lakes aircraft carriers? Still a Model 1. Yes, we are. I like this one, though. I like Plumpton. And I like... Sort of, Minesweeping makes sense for this role. It's kind of like... It's kind of like so many little ships. Um, this one. P.S. Jenny Deans. And in fact, she, of course, famously replaces. Um... Oh. The Waverly. Um... As flagship of her fleet. In World War II, she's employed as a minesweeper. She's a pleasure ship. In World War II, she's used as a minesweeper because, again, paddle wheeled ships are good for minesweeping role. They are good at their they're shallow, they're maneuverable. These things make them very good. It's kind of like one of the reasons I'm really, really shocked moment so far is we haven't got um what's that called? Mm. Brain will think uh, think <sighs> one reason Let me just look it up. Uh, 
Um, you know, one of the things I'm so surprised with azimuth thrusters haven't been employed is for mine sweeping, because I'd have said for a mine sweeping ship, azimuth thrusters would have been an excellent role for them. Hell, I think you, you all know me. My my view on azimuth thrusters is frankly that the the fact that the ships have warships especially haven't started using them beyond um I think the Mistral class has some. <coughs> Polly. <Pardon me. coughs> um It seems a shock to me because I'd say it would make them very, very survivable, but we'll leave that to one side. Azeski, what was the highest speed it could get to? About 19 knots. Probably a bit more if it wanted to. DM Carter, Sheridan had a not good main weapon. Shared with the M60 A2 Starship. Oh, yes. General, Plumpton, adorable name for adorable boat. Mm. Take care, Andrew Cox. Old Richard, ton for ton, EAD's uh, ironclads were very effective riverine gunboats during uh, America's Civil War. Yep, as we already talked about earlier when we mentioned the USS Cairo. That was a good discussion. I liked Cairo. All right, we also have USS Wolverine and USS Sable. Now, I like Wolverine and Sable. You realize they are very different ships quite quickly. They are both, of course, conversions. They are converted from lovely steamers into these practice aircraft carriers, and they have a really interesting history. Technically, IX-64 and IX-81. They are training ships. They have no armor, no hangar deck, no elevators, no armaments, nothing. They're entirely for the Great Lakes, so entirely for peaceful space. But they provide the U.S. Navy with these aircraft carriers that they can practice their operations on. Wolverine starts life as the CNB. Um, just average paddle steamer, really, plying the Great Lakes trade, doing what she could to earn money. She has an interesting structure in that her hull is quite solid, but the levels above her hull are really built on. And there are some very cool pictures of her. Let's see, can I get this picture up? And source. See, when I know I want to have a picture at the same time as another picture, I don't add it into the PowerPoint. I put it up as a second option. Yay, there it is. So, you can see the CNB. This is what she originally looked like. This is what she looks like as a aircraft carrier. Original aircraft carrier. Original aircraft carrier. They've done some very interesting work to give her an island structure and to move her funnels to the port side. Remember, they have to be there. There is far safer for the pilots. <sighs> mm-hmm. <coughs> All right. Uh well, thank you. But don't worry. It was a good. It's a good question, Eric. And 
I said, we've done, uh, I've prepared a whole thing on these because I like these ships. They're pretty cool. And the whole idea, if you think about it, was in the middle of the war, someone stopped and said, right. And this is the big difference in many ways between the, the US Navy, the Royal Navy, and the Japanese Navy. Both the US Navy and the Royal Navy have this desire to keep their pilots alive really, really alive and are using doing things like rotating experienced pilots back to train the new pilots going for and all sorts of things because that's their structure. Japanese system is to, is to not withdraw those warriors because they need to carry on fighting. They're, they're earning their honor. And it does make the best use of your equipment if you have your best pilots in it. The trouble is that means you don't have anyone good training <coughs> your new pilots which means they're not as good, and the attrition starts to work on your experienced pilots because they get tired. U.S. Navy has these. I'm not sure, but I think some of the Royal Navy aircrew also get to use them, um, Wolverine and Sable. But they are converted paddle steamers. And why do you convert a paddle steamer? You want to make it, well, A, they were available and cheap, B, they're large enough. And C, this is the most important thing. Actually, here's the thing. What did we say earlier? Paddle steamers are quite stable. Because their, pa their paddles act as almost sort of outriggers. So that actually makes them better to practice on. Especially in the Great Lakes, which can get pretty choppy. And I was, this is leading edge of the next American invasion of Canada. <laughs> Several definitely think on the point of Panama that we don't talk about but just cause enough. Literally a textbook airborne operation. Yep. Andrew Bond, RCN's MDVs use two by uh, times Z and uh, drive asthma thrusters. I think that, yes, you are right um, from memory, but it's going to sound strange. It's something I'm surprised isn't more adopted. In that, asthma thrusters have been around for quite a while, if you look around for them. And I can really name one nation which has done it. They have, I, I don't think they have elevators on it. They didn't have elevators on this aircraft carrier. They didn't have hangars, anything on them. Uh, Jeff Fielder, Chief and calls the worst tank ever the Marmon Harrington Combat Tank Light, produced for the export market. Our production a rejection by the U.S. Marine Corps in 1939 as a emergency light tank. I do not even want to look that up. If the chieftain calls that terrible, it probably is terrible as anything. Zabazowski, oh my god, paddle wheel tank uh, landing uh, deck carriers? Such things do exist? They do. And look! This picture has a wildcat taking on and taking off from uh, landing and taking off from from one. That's literally what they were used. They were used for touchdowns. So they would land, refuel, if they need it, take off. Dude, enough times you get the pilots used to landing and taking off from a ship. You're going to save lives. Now, the British <coughs> methodology is to use whichever escort carrier isn't currently in service. Um, and have that uh, it isn't currently needed for a convoy, and have that sitting off the coast, not far out from the UK in the Irish Sea or various other places, and just have the pilots go and land on that and take off. Basically, the British would love to have done the American ones, but they never had. Well, No, you couldn't do that and win them here. It's just not big enough. Cute, but yeah, I don't it's not possible and win them here. <clears throat> Sandrum. Honestly didn't think paddle seams could look that good. They looked very good. Jeff Beeler, uh, John South, a paddle wheel aircraft carrier uh, really makes sense as they have to be wider anyway. If you can get a paddle wheel uh, ship up to speed. They might be better than a conventional carrier. Hmm. 
Jeffy, the US Wolverine and Sable are also the only coal burning aircraft carriers ever throughout their careers. Yeah. Jane Peanut, these are the aircraft carriers for Albonia. They would look good. <laughs> Jeff Peter, C and B from Chicago to Buffalo, her regular passenger run. Yep. Anas, no trainers and no, plus no fuel equals Marina's uh, Mariana's per turkey troop. Pretty much. Contradictorious. You'd think a Confucian society be more into emphasis on teaching. Yes and no. And the thing was that you've got a. It's a Confucian society, seen through the samurai lens, to an extent, but also a kind of warped worldview, as it appears in the late nineteen thirties. It's. Yeah, you ha Japan is its own thing in the late 1930s, and there are some really strange ideas running through it. They're really cool ships, though. And they really do do a lot, and they save a lot. But one of the things I will say is uh, this advertisement, this, this postcard, oh my god, is it using artistic license. A... The ships are not in any way near that long. And B, if it's coming that high out the water, then it is literally skipping across the water, not carrying anything in it. But it does look good. Eric Kaufman, my grandfather landed on the Wolverine a bunch. Good for him. Probably saved his life a fair number of times. Jane Peter, I remember seeing a bit about azimuth thrusters in the Aberdeen Maritime Museum circa 2000. I think they have them on the offshore supply vessels. They do have them on offshore supply vessels. Aviator Enterprise, hello! They fished out some of the planes that were pushed overboard and are in a few, mu in a few museums today. Yeah, and there are some places where we don't want to go searching for planes because it wasn't just planes dropped overboard there. I still remember that podcast where we had the archaeologist from Australia on there, and we're basically going, just how much explosive is sitting beneath the oceans? Enough that I, I not, don't think this actually made it into the cut, but there was enough that we were sort of going that we felt the life expectancy of people doing some of the um, Chinese fishing uh, trawling fleet that goes out around the world and doesn't always take notice of where others have warning signs when they're doing their fishing is a far higher risk than perhaps anyone realizes. Dan Freeman, are any Scottish lakes large enough? Ness? No, Windermere is the largest in the country. And mm, probably the best for it from a flying perspective, considering the area, the geography around it. Jamie, the issue with locks isn't length, it's width. Super deep and long, but relatively narrow. Yeah. Peter Dawson, what about the runway on Lake Windmere? Use for the short sunlands. Yes, well, that's. You can use it for landing short sunlands. For actually using an aircraft carrier landing takeoff? Not fast enough. You couldn't keep up fast enough long enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brock Wheeler, a uh, pain. Did any military paddle seamers have two paddle wheels on each side? I recall seeing one or two spin ships. Right? Not many. Is there a wave disruption from multiple wheels? Uh, there can be a wave disruption, and honestly, again, it can complicate things. And again, you've got to remember this was at a time when also broadsides were quite important, and the more paddle wheels you have on the hull, the less space you have for your broadside. 
far better, better. The Navy usually focused on having a bigger paddle wheel rather than multiple paddle wheels. Jeff Healy, your disabled length following conversion would be roughly two thirds of the length of an independence car or aircraft carrier. Yes, without any of the obstacles in between. Oh, good lord. Okay. Dunragana, just notice, congrats on hitting 5k subs. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dunragana. I'm very kind. Rather happy about it as well. But it was sort of a case of, it was just suddenly this afternoon, I suddenly noticed and went, hmm, going to have to do a thank you at some point if it holds up. Because occasionally I lose about 20 or so in a row from um, the lovely people at YouTube, I think, finding out who's actually a fake subscriber or something. So I, um, or just people not liking the channel anymore. So I, uh, you know, I'll see if it holds. I hope it does. As said, the current bet with my aunt is 10,000. John South, Windermere is the largest in England. Most of the Scottish ones are bigger. Um, potentially. You see, most of the Scottish ones, it's going to sound strange. The the Windermere one is the largest thing, but it's also the widest, whereas most of the Scottish ones are narrower. And that's part of the problem. So the Scottish ones tend to be, lo tend to be rather narrow and rather high sides, and there's issues. Very salty. Soviets dumped 15,000 uh, tons of chemical weapons in the Baltic. Bits of crystallized mustard gas sometimes wash up on beaches and people think it's amber. <laughs> hmm. Lake Wimmer is only 11.2 miles long. Loch Ness is 23 miles long. I still wouldn't like to do it. Firth of Clyde. I think that was one of the rare areas used. As said, also we stuck an escort car in the Irish Sea. Hmm. Don't turn up. I'm leaving. Teeth hurt to the point this sounds like needles in my ears. Take care. Hope you get better soon. Hmm. Call me surprised. But anyway, the moon is in the top 10 in the UK. Hmm. Jeff Hitler, surprised the RCN did not do the USS Sable thing for the Commonwealth Air Training Plan plan for the Royal Navy. Probably not enough funds available? Exactly. Mm. Okay, right now we're on to the paddle mine tubers of World War Two. And World War One, we've got Waverly class, literally the Waverly class vessels, 
which we use as paddle minesweepers. And you can really see from the front just how big those paddles are and how what much wider they make the, the ships. It's also another reason that affects their speed. Remember that when talking about ship design, I constantly make the point that it's length to beam ratio. Well, this is a good example of why the length to beam ratio on a um, paddle steamer affects its speed. I'll expand these quickly so you can have a look at them. I don't know what that's doing. Bam, bam, bam. Now, the Glen Avon class are particularly cool because you can just see how powerful they were. They are World War II ships, and they were used for supporting convoys as well along the East Coast. They carried a lot of firepower and very stable gun platforms, as are all. <coughs> Is it... Pay Pen, is there a paddle dieseler? I don't think there was a diesel powered paddle boat. I'm not sure. I have to do some more digging to look at that one. Um, Old oh, Richard, would the paddles generate more or less cavitation noise interference with the mine detection sonar? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. You see, the the you the use normally for the sonar was they did the drift and pulse method so they would literally pulse forward and then they drift and use the sonar that way because that would get rid of cavitation noise entirely because they didn't have the technology and they were far noisier than any of our ships are today really but yeah honestly not sure Alzowski, those paddle boxes truly have the potential of additional AI element. Did the USN get their hands on one and stack them up with 20 million oricons? To be fair, the British ones got stacked up fairly heavily too. I don't think the Americans operate any paddle steamers. 
for this role. Speed of speed. The fastest of the Swiss paddle seamers is De Gallia, the Escalia on Lake Lucerne, 17 knots. Uh, a few of the British ones get up to 19, 20 knots. There are several built and rebuilt as diesel electric in Switzerland. That would make sense. Um. I find it annoying in Britain that we've moved away from having paddle steamers for our pleasure class from the lakes. Waverley's still wandering around, and a few of us are, but, you know, new ones especially aren't, and it just seems a waste of heritage in some respects. They're not really going fast. Peter Dawson, no summer, sonar on Wolverine or Sable, hence no interference. No, certainly no interference on those things. Certainly no interference on them. <coughs> Oh, there it is. There it is, and there it is. <clears throat> <sighs> Cross trials. Are paddle field wheelers more environmentally friendly? I've heard they are. Um, I can see you can make the case they would be. They're less likely to disrupt the seabed or cut up animals um, underwater, but honestly, no. No. Peter, on the Great Lakes, they didn't need escorts. They didn't need anything like that, really. Made life a lot easier on the Great Lakes. If you'd been operating them anywhere else, it would have been problematic and non-stop issues. But the Great Lakes, they were perfect for, and they had the perfect scenario in. Samuel, off topic question. But does anyone know if the Royal Navy warships employ any sort of prairie masker system for hiding ship noise from sonar? Well, no one could really answer that question, but it would point out that the fact is the British were involved in the creation of the prairie maker, so um it, it, you know, if it's available, if it was helped designed by us, it would seem Sensible that we might, you know, employ it if we did to help design it. Carmen, what's the top tank of the naval world? I'm not sure what the Norwegian tank engine of the naval world is. Um... In uh, shallow water, paddle wheels are much less likely to be clogged by modern debris. Yeah, that they are. Dan Freeman, no escort, need for escorts to Great Lake. Good for Freeman, just wasn't trying, was he? No, Great Lakes were beyond the German submarine range, sadly enough. That could have been quite a fun battle. Especially they're trying to get out afterwards.
I was okay. I really thought that except for some leftover passenger ferry ships, paddle steamers ended with the 19th century. Never heard of paddle combat ships in World War II. Thanks, Doc. They had a lot of fun in World War II. They had a lot of fun in World War One. They were useful ships. That's the thing. Uh, navies rarely throw away reliable technology just because it's out of date. If it still works and is still viable for the role, that works. If you're going for a small ship, which isn't going to be much faster than that anyway, why does it matter? It can only do 20 knots. It doesn't matter. Does it matter if it's a paddle steamer or a propeller ship that can do it? Well, no, that doesn't matter either. In fact, you start to go in for it and start to go, right, and what does matter? But it matters it's maneuverable, and it matters it can keep up with a coastal convoy, and it matters it can do the minesweeping role. Yeah, all those that it can do. I now have visions of a U-boat trying to flee up and down the Mississippi. That would have certainly been an interesting one. How they'd have got it there? I suppose they could have used the milk cows. They'd have had to use a lot of them, though. Like... Probably... Five milk cows, and... Want to get one boat in, so you'd have to use a squat, uh, basically a pack of three milk cows to get across the Atlantic. Uh, get across the Atlantic, so you'd have two fill up the other milk, uh, one milk cow and the type, let's say, type seven or type twelve. Um, I think that's one the right one, and then from there. That milk cow would, uh, would go and wait off the coast and fill up the Type 7 before it goes in. Then that would have to go up the up the Mississippi. Could possibly do it in flood season. Um, take on its targets. Come down, refill again off that milk cow. Then they'd have to make out to a mill, meet up with another two milk cows, fill them up to get them home. Very interesting. It would be an interesting idea, but I wouldn't want to... Do it myself, if I'd been him. Very high risk of not coming home. Ryan, uh, you need to enter the locks to get to the Great Lakes. Yes. Uh, Buzowski, was it also those mighty were going around the London A tree? Well, yes, like, but sir, that's a paddle. Of course it does less than 80 knots. Remember, they had to be designed for a speed of 20 knots or less. So a paddle ship would automatically look like it was designed for a speed of 20 knots or less. You might be able to achieve more than 20 knots with a paddle steamer, but, you know, it's rare, but it's possible. Jeff Beeler, the paddle steamers from uh, Minesweepers had a nice wide deck for anti-aircraft guns too. That was an advantage on them. 
they certainly did have many advantages. That's the thing. Right, so I'm making this as being almost three hours long, so we'll finish at the three-hour mark, so about another nine minutes. So I'll take questions, but then I will go off and get some tea. I'm feeling rather peckish this evening. Despite having had a Toby Carberry delivery delivered for lunch. Uh, so you got it. U.S. Demologus building uh, during World War Twelve was twin hulled with paddle in the middle. Mostly mobile battery, but very early war paddle steamer. Yes, and actually the multiple hulls is another advantage of the paddle steamer. I think the um, City Class had about three hulls. So and that, and that could make a big difference in terms of uh, you're staying afloat if you hit something in the ri in the river, let alone if you hit get hit by something. So remember, paddle steamers on rivers dealing with river currents, you can hit things hard. Good to have some reserve buoyancy. The Encarta, a U-boat did go far enough up Cape Fear to fire a few shots at the refinery at Munching Junction in Wilmington. Mm, cool. Very high risk of not coming home. Somewhat typical U-boat missions at the end of World War II. Yep. One thing about early paddling was, is that they induced a mid mind shredding level of cognitive dissonance for some seagoing people who saw them. The perception of rea their perception of reality were broke. <sighs> well, let's be honest. You can understand some very interesting things about them. Although some people did start recommending, uh, reckoning that um, France could invade Britain in a mere few hours. You sit there and go, they have like one ship. They have, like, one steamship. How's that going to get an invasion army across Britain enough time? Do we not have enough troops to resist one ship? If we do, if our army is so pathetic that one shipload of troops, that's a couple of hundred. Maybe more. Let's be nice. Let's say 400 troops can overtake the whole country. Uh, at some point, one has to ask, why are we paying all these generals? Eric Kaufman. I'm from New North Carolina and have never heard about this U-boat raid coming up to Cape Fear. Citation needed. Hmm. Yeah, go on. Let's see what the, what the citations are. One thing about early paddle was... Uh, yeah, I'll answer that one. It was good to have citations. So, any questions, anyone? How are you doing? I said we've got another five minutes. Thank you again to everyone for the super chats. Thank you to everyone for being here chatting. Thank you to everyone who's joined Discord, who's joined um, all the rest. As you know, I haven't yet announced next month's patrons, i.e. January's patrons. That's because as I was away this weekend... I thought I'd give everyone till Saturday, this Sunday to make your suggestions. So there is a link down below to the patron, which ha uh, patron page where you can post suggestions if you're a patron of what topics you'd like covered in January. So please do use it if you're interested. Hi, oh, Jane Peter. Great, thank you for asking. Always happy to ask. Favorite paddle wheeler. Oh, that's easy. My favourite as this be is Plumpton. 
of all the race course design, she's the one I put in there. Because she's my favorite. She's just cute. She is a very special little ship. I just like her. Do you think that no post World War II paddle warships? Also, we do not cover the Crimean War and the mighty USS Vanderbilt, flagship of the USN, at the bombardment of Valparaiso in Valparaiso in 1866. No, because the bombardment of Valparaiso is definitely going to be its own one at some point. And post World War II paddle ships? Well, there aren't really any warships that are post World War, uh, post -World War II. There are some left over from World War II, but they don't tend to get repeated. Hmm. Um, Piet Potato Peon is it not paddle related, but could, do you would you know where I could find out more details about Martin Shell, the one that got filled with um, molten iron? Hmm. I think there is a book co-authored, or I can't remember the second author, by um, Crawford. <laughs> By uh, John Lambert. I think. I think that's who you'll be looking for, John Lambert. I think he co authored a book on that topic. But I can't for the life of me remember the name. But I think it's on sh it's on shells and I, I think they say I think it's on shells and weapons which fired them or something like that. Early shells and weapons which fired them. Okay, right. Dean Carter, I'm from New York, Carolina as well, a long-term 25-year volunteer at the battleship. I believe it's recounted in Willington at War. Well, that's a cool thing to go look up. Um, winner of the... Dan Freeman, future paddleships as warships for shallow draft or similar in modern era? No, you just build a small unmanned vessel and send it in. Um, Jeff Wheeler, my favorite paddle boat warship is the Guadalupe of the Mexican Navy. Well, that's going to be subject of a special, I swear, on the... We're going to call that the Texas-Mexican War and just... Have, uh, Mex I think it's called the Texas-Mexican War or something like that. And we're going to have we'll have that on... We'll do a special on that because that would be cool to look at. <sighs> Carl Gasford, how would an East Galaxy Company colonial cruiser look like? Um, armed to the teeth, but cheap as chips. Go to art. Hello. Back to Blackburn, Blackburn. I believe his main quality is that it can easily fly backwards in a strong breeze, sort of preempting the helicopter. That's quite possible. 
Um, Jeff Hiller, were the 1840s the high water mark of blue water paddle ships? I would say more the 1860s. They're still developing at that point. Can Adrian, the FRA wants to say hello. That is. No, no, no. The Blackburn Blackburn is clearly an avatar of Dominus. <laughs> oh, God, the hell was. Text Max Yeah. Hmm. Chris Southgate, loads in the American Civil War off the coast in 1865. Yes. Jim Peter, uh, if that's the thing, there is a great Discord, and there is a wonderful Discord. I think it's, you know, being uh, run by Brock Payne, I think, actually, and I'm definitely Paul from Chicago is part of it and a few others, where they have actually got a their own server where they're doing a whole real-world ship exercise, you know, turn-based... <clears throat> naval ship version of well it's just it's a role player game and it's just cool I, I, I don't take part and I, I pop in and watch but there is a temptation occasionally when I am when I have got through this the stage of editing and everything that there will be an Arafusa class cruiser turn up to tag along with the destroyers because you know I, I feel the best thing to randomly enter on is an Arafusa class cruiser because they often back up the little destroyers. And, um, you know, it's just nice to have someone come along with six-inch guns to say, I want to be your friend. Let's go find something to blow up. Michael Sedgwick, thanks. First time in life, and I have enjoyed it very much. I'm glad you have. Thank you. For, and hello, welcome. Fine evening, everyone. Take care. Right. Uh, Jeffy, the recent book on World War II, Netherlands Navy, goes into the historical backyard. Also, Conway's and Jane's and Brassies. Brassies is always excellent. As we see, I am slowly working on my collection of Brassies. As I keep pointing out, Brassies and Classic Janes. I should probably do a bit more work on Classic Janes. I've got plenty of these, though. Um, which is going to be the special for the first brew ships of the new year is going to be the transactions books of the Institute of Naval Architects. So if you're interested, that's where it's going to come from. Uh, that's been pushed back to new year because I just need time to prep it. Trent Lenko, have you run into anything recognisable such as a pre-World War II paddle-wheeled landing craft? Not really per se. I have run into small boats of the model of sort of um, sort of real-life versions of that, that thing being used for it, but no. Not landing craft per se, just small boats being used to get trips ashore. <laughs> All right. Take care, Dean Carpenter. Take care, Eric Kaufman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nautical Wolf. Thank you, Jeff Beeler. Take care, Ron. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And once again, thank you, everyone, for taking part. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care. Take care, Jermak. Um, take care, Shadmiral Abazaski. Thank you, DGV40. Thank you, Jeff Beeler. Thank you, Belenora. Thank you, uh, Trousers, Thank you, DM Carpenter. Thank you, Howard Maxi. Thank you, um, AKM72. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, uh, Greg Sarsky. Thank you, Shadmiral. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Const uh, Eric Kaufman. Thank you, Talon Gasper. Thank you, DGV40. Thank you.
Thank you, Jacob Werner. Thank you, Dunrick Ironhammer. And thank you, Andrew Bend. Thank you, Howard Maxey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dutchman. Thank you, Carl Harmon. Thank you, Stephen White. Thank you.